The 12th chapter is an interesting chapter. We, I'm sure we won't get through all of it, but I hope to get through enough of it to entice you to really study all of it because this chapter is about priorities. It, it helps all of us kind of get our priorities in line as we go through life. It's also about integrity. I don't know if any of you have ever really looked at the definition of integrity and the root word there and, and all that, but integrity means all the parts fit together to complement one another that there's no contrary parts. And so the chair you sitting in is thus far successfully holding your weight. And, uh, and that means each of the four legs is, is working together. Each, each of the legs is working together with the other three legs. And they're working together with the back. And they're working together with the seat and the arms in order to uh, be a chair with integrity. And I don't know if you've ever sat in a chair. Gail and I have some plastic chairs. And, and after they're a few years old, they start to crack and things like that. And if you sit in them, then you can fall. And uh, I've done that a few times. And those chairs lack integrity when, when, uh, when they dump you on the ground like that. And do you know what we do with those chairs when they lack integrity? We throw them away. No, we don't redeem them. We don't try to fix them. We just put them in the dumpster, typically that dumpster right back there that you pay for every month. And uh, we, we just throw them away because they lack integrity. So it's still got four legs. It's still got a seat, still got arms, still got a back. But they don't work together anymore because there's a broke. There's, a, there's something broken in them. There's a crack. And every one of us as we go through life... We go through stages where we have integrity, which is always wonderful. And when we have integrity, we're more trustworthy. We're, we are, have a clearer conscience. We are able to do things with better ability. We are, because our brain complements our body, complements our emotions, complements what we, what we believe lines up with what we do. What we say lines up with what we believe. And that's complemented by where we go and what we do and all that type of thing. So, so a life of integrity means all the, all the pieces fit together. But we human beings also go through stages in life where integrity is threatened. And, and I think any of you that have studied developmental psychology or human development through the decades know that when you go through different stages in life, there will be different things that will challenge your uh, integrity, because uh, you'll be experiencing different things, and then you have to decide. Are you going to be healed, and are you going to regain integrity, or are you going to be broken? And so sometimes when people start to break, then they'll start drinking too much, or they'll start using something to medicate themselves, or they'll start adapting some immoral behaviors or something like that. And then there, it, it creates this internal dissidence, this confusion or this conflict inside of themselves where they believe one thing, but they find themselves doing another. Or they make a decision to do one thing and one thing to find themselves and find themselves doing another. And of course, in our lives, we often will look at other people and say, wow, they really have it together. I hope I do someday. And, uh, and sometimes people are broken, but they falsely believe they have it together. That's why Jesus said he came for those who were in need. He came for the broken. He came for those that are in despair because nobody can put us together the way Jesus can put us together. And uh, Jesus loves us, and Jesus gave his life for us, but he knows there are things here in the earth that if we succumb to them, they will lower us from the best God created us to be. And they will cause us to be, well, actually, um, uh, if a human being goes through certain things in life and succumbs to them, they essentially become animals. But we weren't created to be animals. We were created to be in the image and likeness of God. We were created to be healers and restorers. We were created to be redeemers. We were created to um, be a, a higher than the animal kingdom. And, but, but we are certainly capable of breaking to the point that we're just simply animals. 
And so, and then there are all the stages in between. So, so here, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, and, and just about this whole chapter is Jesus coaching his disciples and, and establishing priorities in them and coaching them on how to maintain integrity and how to maintain uh, dignity in life and, and how to view others. Uh, as he goes through this, it's very, very interesting as he establishes things like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in everything else, all these things, talking about material possessions, will take care of themselves. And so he establishes seek the kingdom first. You know, keep your prayer time. Keep your Bible study time. Keep growing in the Lord. And then let some of the other things work out. Don't live exclusively for a bank account. We need bank accounts. We need funds. God wants to bless us with those things, but they're not the priority. All right, there's something that has to be a higher priority. Otherwise, the love of money will create evil in us. And, and so, so, so money's important. He's not saying it's bad, but if you start to love it and make it a priority, it messes up your life and will ruin your integrity. All right, because every one of us have a desire to be better than we are to grow in integrity, to grow in uh, appropriate priorities. And if you'll think about it, as you're raising your kids, a lot of raising a child is teaching priorities. How to share a toy, because owning the toy isn't that big of a deal. And so how to share the toy with, with somebody else, or, or how to be kind to somebody else instead of being mean. And so it establishes a priority or how to protect a weaker person. I don't know if I've ever told you, but the first fist fight I ever had in my life was we were raised near an Amish community and the Amish kids would go to school. There was a time when Indiana law required the Amish kids to start school. They would start that day. They wouldn't start in the kindergarten or first grade. They would start the day the law required them and they would just go until the law didn't require them and then they'd be gone. And so and the Amish girls always wore a long dress, they wore a bonnet, they were pacifists, they would not defend themselves. And so when I was in the eighth grade, there was a group of boys mocking one of the uh, Amish girls, and so I got in a fight with them. They beat the tar out of me. And, um, and so, but the girl got away. And that evening, there was a line of horse and buggies at our house where the Amish uh, fathers were there thanking me for protecting their uh, little girl. And so, so there, there's, there's something about this thing about being able to protect somebody else. That's a higher priority than maybe protecting ourselves. That's why we love the police department. That's why we love our, those who serve in the military because they do, they do things not just for them, they do things for us so that we can gather together like this and worship in freedom and in peace. None of us are afraid right now. And, um, and so, so this thing of integrity is an important thing. So here he lists uh, several things that establishes um, some principles. Let me just show you some of the principles in chapter 12. And if you'll just follow along with this, Lisa. In verse 21, it says, A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. See, that right there establishes it. Now, it doesn't say it's bad to store up earthly wealth. It's okay to do that. And actually, earthly wealth makes all of life more convenient. If you have money in your account, it's easier to get your tire changed than if you don't. All right, so, so we don't want to store up earthly wealth because of greed. We want to store up earthly wealth because we love giving to others and because of convenience in life. All right. But here it puts it in priority. Uh, it, it's a foolish thing to store up earthly wealth and not have a rich, rich relationship with God. So we want to develop a rela rich relationship with God. That will establish integrity. It makes our parts work together. And it establishes priorities for us. If you go down to verse 31, here, this is what I referred to earlier. Here it says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Now, do you need an education? Yes, because every one of us need to be skilled. All right. Do you need to uh, learn to write and speak? Well, yes, because every one of us are created to communicate. All right. 
Do we need to um, do all kinds of things, develop skills, develop relationships, enhance the relationships in our family, in our church, in our community? Yes, all those things are important, but nothing is more important than seeking the kingdom of God. See, and so it establishes priority, and once that priority is established, then all of our parts start to work together, and we can have integrity. If we do things that harm the kingdom of God working in us, then it throws everything else off, it, and, and it causes there to be conflict and a lack, ultimately, a lack of integrity. If you go all the way to verse uh, 48, in verse 48... Um, here, the last part of verse 48, it says here, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. So here, um, uh, here we understand this is a principle in all of life. So whether it's a corporation or whether it's P politics or media or church, if you've been given much, much more is required of you. So we need to increase our competence and increase our integrity. And like all of you know that a political official is under more scrutiny than, let's say, a journalist. All right? And, and all of you know that a... Hey, stop it. Okay? And, and all of you know that uh, a, a, man, a man working in our community in a menial job is not under near the, the scrutiny that the mayor would be. All right? And, and so, so that's a principle that works in life. So you may say, I would like to have a more powerful position so that we know the principle is we'll develop integrity with small things. As we're faithful in the small things, then... We can be competent with larger things. If we're unfaithful in the small things, then we won't be competent in the large things. And we have to understand, if somebody's given much, much is going to be required of them. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Do you see how that establishes priorities? Every one of us get to do that. And some of us will say, some of us, well, people are judging me more than they're judging the other guy. Listen, that's all. there are scales for all of that kind of thing. No reason to whine and no reason for us to complain about it or any of that. It's just a reality. It's the way things are going to work. And so these, this chapter is full of universal principles that help every one of us grow in integrity and, and so our parts work together for the whole so we do what we believe, we say what we believe, we live what we believe, and in the areas that lack integrity, then we can catch it and prioritize so we get the pieces so they work together. And all of you know in the design of that chair, if the legs on the chair were the wrong lengths, so you had four different lengths of legs on that chair, you wouldn't be as comfortable as you are right now. <laughs> All right? Or if the seat was made of something different than it is, you would, especially those of you with no bottom, you wouldn't be as comfortable as you are right now. All right? But there's padding there on the back, on the seat. There are arms. There are things that work together to give you comfort. And that's the exact same way our lives are. There are things that work together to make it work as a whole. Every organization needs to have integrity in order to be efficient. Every one of our families needs to have integrity in order to be efficient. Our church has to have integrity this morning. Aaron taught the class. It was beautiful. All right. Mr. Charles made sure the uh, refreshments were up there. And so Mr. Charles did his part. Aaron did his part. A whole bunch of you came to the class. Everybody did their part. Right now there are classes going on for our little kids. People are doing their part. So we can all be without our children and living in peace right now. <laughs> okay, so... So it's a wonderful thing when the church operates with integrity, each part doing its own, so we can all uh, function normally. Okay, so he starts off by talking about how they view, how his disciples view religious leaders. 
and he assures them that they don't need to gripe about the hypocrisy amongst religious leaders. Now, let me talk just one moment about hypocrisy. None, none of us want to have hypocrisy. But I have become convinced the older I get that everybody's a hypocrite to one degree or another. Because yes. I've learned librarians, lots of them, like movies more than books. <laughs> and I've learned as the years go by, sometimes a police officer will drive faster than the speed limit. You know, just because they want to get there faster. Huh, Sean? And, so, and, 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 and sometimes, all right, think, think of the role of a pastor. A pastor's job is to teach the scriptures. Because it's the word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So a pastor's job is to teach the scriptures. All right, so let's say a pastor is trying to grow in his prayer life, but he's assigned to teach pray without ceasing. All right, so could a pastor preach on prayer without fully achieving the expectations from Scripture himself or herself? Could that happen? All right, so if that happens, let's say prayer without ceasing, or let's say never forsake the gathering of yourselves together, and the pastor just skipped Wednesday night's men's Bible study. Okay, so, but he's got to teach on never forsaking uh, the gathering of ourselves together. So is the pastor a hypocrite? Oh, sure he is. Yeah. And, and, and so, so the issue is every one of us want to be better people than we are. Sometimes a chemistry teacher has to restudy the material to get the material down and correct. And as they're teaching it, they're, it's just dawning on them or they're in the process of figuring out the material themselves. All right, so every one of us are in this process. But here's what the Lord says to the disciples about this. When the Lord's speaking to the disciples in the introductory paragraph, it says, it says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. In other words, we should never embrace hypocrisy. We should be honest. We should tell the truth. And please understand, I say this knowing the good and the bad side of this lesson. All right. Here it says, it says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. The time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed. And all that is secret will be made known to all. Now, here's what I suspect was going on. The disciples, as you know, were common people. And there were great religious leaders of the day. But as you know, the common people very often know what really goes on. So in public, they make great prayers, but they may know they don't really have a prayer life. Or in public, they give to the poor, but they know they really don't. The common people know they really don't have a concern for the poor. Or in public, they do a show of godliness but the common people know in private they don't really have a heart of godliness. And here Jesus is saying there's no such thing as a secret. Don't be disturbed by the fact that you know the behind. Is, now I'm speaking to you conspiracy theorists. Don't be concerned that you think you know the story behind the story. Because in the end, everything will be laid bare. So don't work yourself up and don't put yourself in a position where you're concerned about the hypocrisy of the scribes or the Pharisees or the leaders at the temple because everything's going to be laid bare. And so the phrase I use for this is just simply, there is no such thing as a secret. Those of you that have lived as long as I have, you know the very best headlines were someone else's secret. The lead story in the evening news was, is typically something that somebody else expected to keep secret. And so I think it's a good thing in our lives just to kind of have the model of if I expect to keep it secret, I probably shouldn't do it. Or if I expect nobody else to find out about it, I probably shouldn't go there. 
And so if every one of us start to think that way, then we develop more integrity. Now, no doubt about it, every one of us have kept secrets. And there's no doubt about it, every one of us have done things that we count on nobody else ever finding out. Well, we can say corporately, how did that work out for us? What could possibly go wrong? And so, so here I think Jesus is saying, live your life as if there's no such thing as a secret. He might be saying, there is no such thing as a secret. And so if that is the case, then that might have something to do with how we drive our car. That might have something to do with what we do with our money. That might have something to do with what we do with our time. That might have something to do with what we do in our prayer closet or what we do in our relationships. See, if we just develop the, the, the thing, and listen, here's one of these things where, where we have privacy, but at the same time, you know, we have this scripture here that says, with absolute clarity, the time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. Isn't this encouraging scripture? This is the type of scripture we all should memorize, huh? Okay. Whatever you have said in the dark. So in other words, as soon as we say, okay, now I need to tell you something, but this needs to be 100% confidential. Yeah. All right. As soon as we, and by the way, I did that Wednesday night in the men's meeting. I said, okay, guys, we need to talk about this, but it's got to be 100% confidential. And I was thinking on the inside, that isn't going to work out too well. Okay, and so we need to have that, and no doubt about it, there needs to be confidential things that go on between a husband and a wife. There need to be confidential things that go on in a family setting or, or maybe in a church business meeting when they're working out on, on how to get some money to a poor family or how to help somebody pay a bill or whatever. You don't want to broadcast those types of things, but here this is saying, keep integrity. It says, and what you have wished, here, here he really develops it. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. That means it's going to be in the newspaper. All right, so, so everybody, here Jesus is starting off. Now, get the context. The context is Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they're talking about the Pharisees. And so the subject is the Pharisees. And what he's saying is, what they're keeping secret isn't going to stay secret. And the way they're being deceptive, it's, they're not going to get away with it. So, so he's saying, don't worry about it. So to us, he's saying, don't worry about it. Gail has a phrase that is very interesting. When people come up to Gail and start to tell her something about other people that Gail doesn't want to know, Gail responds, oh, it's okay. Those things are too wonderful for me. <laughs> she gets that from David. David said that. These things are too wonderful for me. So in other words, she doesn't need to know the negative material about anybody else. Does that make sense? All right, so, so they're saying negative material about the Pharisees, and Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter. you don't need to know it. It's all going to be dealt with in the future. So those of you that have been betrayed, don't worry. It'll be dealt with in the future. Those of you that have had your heart broken, don't worry. It'll be dealt with in the future. God is God. God is wonderful, and God knows how to deal with situations if we will keep integrity and walk with purity before the Lord by his grace, by his mercy, if we'll keep growing, keep striving. I'm not saying any of us in the room are perfect right now, but I am saying we really want to be. Does that make sense? All right, and see, that's, that's where, where, the, where the opening door happens. And where we're tripped up is typically not our own stuff or not exclusively our own stuff. Where we're tripped up is when we start to pretend to be God of somebody else. So we have an opinion about their prayer life or about their giving or about 
their marriage or their kids or their words or their attitude because, all right, follow this, everybody. God has grace on them for them. Just like God has grace on you for you. And God has grace in me for me. And I know you intercessors, I've kind of worn you out. But, but, God has grace on me for me. So as he's progressively growing me in prayer, sanctification, prayer and fasting, power, miracles, all those types of things, he has grace on me for me. But if you start judging me, you're on your own. Because he doesn't have grace on you for me. But he will have grace on you for you. Does that make sense? Is this making sense? Or am I just confusing people? I'm a little confused myself. All right, so, so follow this, everybody. Follow this, everybody. So Jesus is saying, hey, you guys, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. Then he says, God's going to take care of it. There's no such thing as a secret. So the things you've heard about, doesn't matter if they're true or not. God's going to take care of it. There's no such thing as a secret. You hear it? See, this is very interesting. Isn't this interesting? Jack, where are you? Do you think this is interesting? Very, very interesting. Yes, I love you, Jack. Okay, so, so, so follow this. This is his introduction to, this, to, a, to an entire chapter on priorities here. His, it's his introduction to say, to say that's going to go on. Now, where are the exceptions with that? The exceptions are in chain of command. All right, so if you're a mom and a dad over a family, you need to know some of the things about what goes on with the kids. All right? If you're a commanding officer, you need to know what's going on amongst those under your command because you have a responsibility for them. If you are the owner of a business, you need to know about employees. All right, right now, we've got people teaching in there and we've got people teaching up there. I'm the senior pastor. I get to make a judgment on those people. All right, because there are certain people that are never going to be in that nursery, I guarantee. <laughs> All right, and there are other people that are never going to be up there in the children's church. I get to make that decision. That's a responsibility of mine because of chain of command. It's not because I'm superior. It's because of the position. Does that make sense? All right, and somebody processed the offering today. The offering that you gave a few minutes ago. I guarantee you that was not a person that just got out of prison last week and came and volunteered to process the offering for us. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, so, no, we have them teaching the nursery. So, <laughs> see, you realize how appalling that is. All right, so there is, there is a place for judgment. You work at Integrity Bank, you look at bank records, and you have to be able to make judgments about those numbers. All right? But I don't. See? So the customers that Christy has to deal with, there's no reason for me to have an opinion about it. So I would say, those things are too wonderful for me. But Christy needs to make a decision about those things. All right? So, so think about your chain of command. You have families. And you may be in a position of chain of command in your family, or you may be position of chain of command. The mayor, the mayor down here, John Southers, he's got to have an opinion about certain things that I don't have to have an opinion about. I do not care about uh, storm water drainage. It's just too wonderful for me. <laughs> All right. But I do want John Southers and the city council to be all up in a tizzy about all that kind of thing because I don't want this building to flood. Do you? No. no. All right. So you see how this works? You see what Jesus is doing here? Jesus is starting this off. Then he starts off with, dear friends, don't be afraid. This is verse 4, Lisa. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't do any, any more to you after that. Now, let me talk about this just a little bit. What? Did I read it right? Or are you guys just talking? Okay. All right. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do 
any more to you after that. Leave this up here just a little bit, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind, please. Now, everybody, this right here is fundamental to integrity. If you fear people that can kill you or a family member, you can be held hostage by anybody. We see a count of a, after a count of people that don't have assurance in heaven. So they kidnap a child and threaten and manipulate people, blackmail people, or they kidnap a loved one. Me and my family, we've met together periodically through the years, and we've said, we believe in heaven with absolute assurance. And I bet now, it's no longer the case now, but it used to be back in the day where there was opportunity with my decision making where somebody could try to manipulate that. And I assured my children, if you're ever kidnapped, I'm not going to rescue you. You're going to heaven. Because I'm not going to influence people this way or that way. To try to, to, now, I'll try to save you. But I'm not going to be manipulated. Because we believe in heaven. We're going to heaven. All right. So if somebody, uh, I, I trust that if somebody kidnapped me to get you to do something, you would just say, Ted's going to heaven. Take him. You see it? Because if you fear death, you can be manipulated. If you have a power position especially, you can be manipulated by anybody. All right, so you have to settle in your mind. Is heaven what we believe or is it not? It's a major priority. And if you don't settle that, then all kinds of haywire things can go on in your life. Now, here's where it happened to me. Some of you might remember many years ago, my mother was sitting on the front row of the church. This was up at New Life. There were probably, I don't know, 6,000 people there that morning. All right, she was sitting right there where uh, Raina is, is sitting right now. And right after my sermon, she bowed her head and died. She was dead. Okay. The church was divided about it. Some people said she thought that was the most glorious sermon my son just preached. It makes me want to go to heaven. Other people said, oh, he's my son. There's no way for me to get out of this. How can I get out of this church? For that? Okay. And so one way or another, the Lord allowed her escape. All right. <clears throat> so, so Dr. West was sitting right behind her in the state of Colorado. It takes an, the head of an emergency room to keep the uh, emergency medical people from trying to resuscitate somebody and taking them to the hospital. And so Dr. West was right there. My mom had gone home to be with the Lord. She left very specific instructions that if that happens, to let her go. And so she did. Ruth Ann um, Johnson was at home that morning because it was a snow morning. And uh, she was washing dishes when that happened. And she saw an open vision. She saw the exact scene that was there. She saw everybody that was around accurately. And she saw a staircase descend in front of mom. Now mom was overweight, arthritic, and had uh, blood sugar issues. So when that staircase descended in front of her, mother stepped out of her body. Ruth Ann saw all this. And, and, Ma, and there were angels periodically up the staircase going up into the clouds. All of you know the scene up there. It was in the, before we built the a round building, it was in the, uh, in the square building. All right. And Ruth Ann saw mom lean up out of her body. Her body was laying there, but her spirit leaned up. And started going up the stairs. And as she would go up the stairs, she got younger, thinner, more vibrant. By the time she got to the top of the stairs, she was leaping up the stairs like kids do on these stairwells every Sunday. Okay? She was leaping up the stairs. And at the top of the stairs was my dad, Marcus. He grabbed her and they kissed long and hard. Okay, then there were family members all around. And mom, now Ruth Ann saw all this. 
and mom saw the family members. Amazingly enough, Ruth Ann doesn't know one member of my extended family, not a name. She was able to name all of them that they met there. I knew who they were. Some of them are in southeastern Kansas. Some of them are in different places around. But she was able to name everybody mom met. And then my dad said, are you ready, Rachel? You want me to take you in to meet him? And in holding hands, my dad walked my mom into the throne room. They went in. The meeting was indescribable. And then Jesus said, Rachel, Rachel's my mom's name. Rachel, let's go on a walk. Because I need to explain to you why this is the right time. And so Jesus and mom left and they went on a walk. And Jesus told mom about Johnny, my oldest brother. Then Danny, the next brother. Then Timmy. Then Teddy. That took a long talk. <laughs> then Mary. Then Rachel. Now, what was interesting? Ruth Ann didn't know any of those names. By this time, she'd left her kitchen sink because she realized she was having a major spiritual experience. She, but she hadn't heard mom and died at church. She was just seeing this. All right, so she sat down at the kitchen table and started to take notes. So she took notes on what Jesus said to mom about Johnny. And why it was important for mom to go to heaven right then. And about Danny. And about Timmy. And about Teddy. And about Mary Lois. And about Rachel Ann. She took notes on all this. While she was taking notes on this subject, the phone rang. And a lady from the church said, you maybe ought to run up here. Rachel Haggard died at the end of church today. And she's still here in the auditorium. Gail and Ted and the family members are gathering. Can I everybody? When the funeral happened for mom, some of you were there. 1,500 people were there. And Ruth Ann, for the first time in her life, saw my siblings, met my siblings. And she took them up aside one at a time and told them what Jesus told mom. Okay, after that, I went home. That's when we lived up on Wrangler's Way. You remember? We were living up by you guys. You were, what were you, in high school then? Huh? You were in college? We were living up by the Selvix. It was awesome. Selvix protected our house. It'd shoot at it from time to time. <laughs> okay. So I went home, and it was after the funeral, after all that. And uh, I just sat down on my bed. I don't know if you've ever lost a loved one, but for, it doesn't matter how old you are. When you lose your mom and your dad, it impacts you. And, and what it did in me is it made me feel insecure. Because I'd, I'd always had the prayers of my, my mother. So I was feeling insecure, feeling sad, and I sat down on my bed in our house on Wrangler's Way, and I was just sitting there crying. And uh, the Holy Spirit came on me. And the Holy Spirit said, if you'll lay back on your bed and fall asleep, I will show you something, and you will never grieve your mother's death again but I can't let you remember it. I laid back on my bed, fell asleep, and I woke up, and I have never grieved my mother's death since because I saw something. I received a spiritual assurance of heaven, of eternal life, of the reality of eternal life in heaven, of the reality of Jesus' assurance, I received such a confidence 
in whatever happened during that time. And I'll tell you what, it's weird because not only have I never grieved my mother's homegoing sense, I've never grieved the homegoing of any believer. And I have to be very careful doing funerals because it's disrespectful. Because I'm actually kind of happy about it. <laughs> because in my mind, I cannot make going to heaven sad. I can't do it. And sometimes when I'm trying to explain, I'll try, sometimes I'll start to explain heaven and I start to explain things that I don't know how I know. Because it's buried somewhere in my spirit or my subconscious mind or whatever. But there is something there, everybody, that I know, that I know, that I know that this earth is just a pilgrim's journey. And there is a home that is so much better than this that the Lord has prepared for me and for you. And for us to pretend that this is the most important series of events in our lives is lunacy because heaven is so real. And everybody, listen. If someone kidnapped me and said, we're going to kill you, I would say, come on with that. <laughs> I mean, whatever they were trying to manipulate, it just wouldn't work with me. Now, I, my children do not share this the way I do, but I have assured them I'm not going to negotiate for their release. Love you too, Dad. Yeah, love you too, Dad. <laughs> Okay, here's what that does. It makes, them, it makes them so they're not vulnerable. Now, if it really happened, I don't know. But, because, you know, let's see, Sam, what's, a, what's the phrase? Uh, the best plans never survive initial engagement. Close? Close enough for a non-Air Force guy. See here when he says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. Now, I'm, everybody wear your safety belts afterward. Everybody, you know, because you do have people here on the earth you need to take care of. Your lives are important here. But don't you be afraid of those that are going to try to threaten you maybe. They can't do any more to you after that. And Jesus' reward is great. Okay, we have covered the first four verses. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, everybody. This chapter is awesome. So take it and eat this chapter up. Because if you'll take this chapter and establish these priorities in you, oh my gosh, you can lower your meds, you can sleep through the night. There'll be all kinds of wonderful opportunities for every one of us as we establish these priorities in our hearts. Let's all stand. Oh, I didn't even get to the part where how much he values you and treasures you and wants to provide for you and take care of you. And it, this chapter is just wonderful, all right? Bow your heads and close your eyes. How many of you were say, would say, yeah, I've been living too much for this world and I repent. Just lift your hand up and say, I've been living too much for this world and I repent. I'm not going to live for money. I'm not going to live for these worldly things. I commit my life to Christ I commit my life to his kingdom. I seek his kingdom first and foremost. And there's coming a day when that ladder will come my way and my loved ones will meet me in glory to take me to the throne room. And I am not going to let a bank account or personal pride or the avoidance of pain or any of that 
block my receiving of what Christ has done in his love for me. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, you see these hands all over this room where these people are saying, along with me, we're surrounded by every kind of temptation, but we want to be people of integrity. We want to be people of the kingdom. We want to be people of life. We want to be people full of your spirit. We don't want to waver to the right or the left. We want to be like the chairs we've been sitting in. We want to be people where all the pieces work together so we can be everything you want us to be. We love the purpose you've given us. We love the independence you've given us. We love the freedom you've given us. Now work it deep into us, Holy Spirit. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Enjoy your Independence Day, everybody. The Lord Jesus bless you richly.